Hi guys, so today uh, we'll start talking about the application layer and I will begin with a brief discussion of the history of the internet because it uh, turns out that's actually interesting and also important for when you consider how internet got here and why we still need to deal with protocols the way they are. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit about a little bit about um, application requirements in terms of network performance. Okay, so um, we started uh, the kind of global network from uh, telephone networks that were deployed all the way from, oh geez, I don't know when they started, but I guess this is a picture from 1940s. Um, and so these were basically circuit switched networks. And so what you would do is you would pick up a phone, you would call um, the operator and then you would give them the number you want to connect to and then they would kind of move the wire from your incoming connection to the connection of um, whoever it is that you wanted to call. Uh, so that worked when we had few numbers. Um, eventually, of course, we moved to sort of automatic, automated switching. Um, but that was sort of the, the first deployment of global networks into users' home was through the telephone. Um, little known fact, we also had pretty early on in the 1960s um, wireless telephones. That's a model that was used in cars and what you would do is basically um, kind of select a frequency that wasn't taken. There weren't that many frequencies but then also there weren't that many phones. There was maybe just one central radio tower per city and you could dial in a number for automated switching. So uh, this was super fancy back then. Now, the problem with these networks is that they were very inefficient with the bursty traffic. So what people observed is that mm, computers generated traffic on, in kind of, um, they generated bursty traffic. So they would do some processing and then they would send some data. Uh, this is also actually true for voice where, as I mentioned, we speak and then there's actually a lot of silence in between the words that we speak. So the challenge was how to make these networks, these networks work efficiently with bursty traffic such that uh, the bandwidth wouldn't need to be reserved for the entire time of the connection but only for the transmission times. And so people started theorizing um, about packet switch networks where instead of reserving a circuit you would just send packets with data um, and then those packets would be interleaved on a particular path. Um, Leonard Kleinrock was one of the first people that started theorizing about this. There were others. Um, and Kleinrock built the first router, um, which is basically a machine for receiving and forwarding packets. So this is kind of the first build of a, of a router. Um, and um, they started kind of building these networks in about 1961. I think that's when the uh, kind of first packet switch paper came out uh, from, from Kleinrock. In 1969, the internet had four nodes. Those were at UCLA, Stanford, uh, UCSB, where I did my PhD, and University of Utah. So that was the early, early internet um, running, sort of uh, running basically an NCP protocol. Um, in 1972, this was expanded to 15 nodes, and um, ARPANET, which was kind of the precursor to DARPA, um, so ARPANET was an early network, um, was also running NCP, developed at UCLA. And there was also the first email program, all built in 1972. Interestingly, this is the first RFC. RFCs are documents that specify the operation of network protocols. It stands for request for comment. And the way this was done back in the day and still is, is that you would post a, a write-up of a protocol, which was a request for comment. And then people who were working on the internet could comment on it and evolve that protocol. And this is still the process today, where eventually these... Um, RFCs are finalized, and so there are RFC numbers for um, TCP, HTTP, all these protocols that we'll um, end up talking about in more detail. Okay. Um, at about the same time, there was also development in wireless networking. So AlohaNet is the first example of that. And the idea was to connect the different Hawaiian islands with, a, with wireless links. Um, on the same channel and then different computers could send packets through through those channels The interesting thing was that this was the first network that didn't use direct connections between nodes 
but used a shared medium where nodes had to take turns. And so we had sort of a first medium access control protocol that coordinated these nodes, excuse me. Um, based on the AlohaNet, um, we also had Metcalf develop the Ethernet protocol, which initially looked like this. This is the original drawing. And the way the first Ethernet worked is that you had one cable. So it was kind of a coaxial cable. And then you would have these vampire taps which would kind of clamp onto the cable and puncture it in a particular way to connect to the two conduits through the channel. Um, this uh, cable was called the ether and anybody could connect to it. And this ether was basically a shared channel such that anybody could speak on it. They would have to take turns and anyone could listen to it. So from the point of view of access in terms of taking turns, this was not all that different from AlohaNet. So AlohaNet was kind of drove the ideas of Ethernet. Now Ethernet works very differently and the joke is that no matter what the kind of local area network or LAN technology looks like, it will just always be called Ethernet. Okay, so by 1980s we had about, by the end of 1980s we had about 100,000 nodes in the Internet and um, the problem that was observed is that all these different networks kind of in the early 80s were disconnected and so the problem became of how to connect the different networks together through internetting also known as network of networks that's where the word internet um, comes from okay so in the 1980s we also had a large proliferation of networks um, arpanet which was the defense network bitnet csnet which is a computer science network between universities and a CEPHnet, which was used for research. So all these different networks um, coexisted and they, they used NCP or network control protocol, but there was a need to kind of standardize and connect them. And so people developed the TCP protocol, which initially included IP, uh, then IP was separated out and UDP was also separate, separated from that. But um, to switch all these networks onto TCP, there was a flag day when everybody decided to uh, basically, everybody shut down their networks, uh, reconfigured them to use TCP, and then connected them back up again. Um, so today, this idea of shutting down the internet to do something is pretty much infeasible, but this was kind of the last moment to do something like that. And so <laughs> effectively, we are stuck with TCP IP forever. Uh, people also developed the uh, domain name service, which allowed um, a mapping between IP addresses and kind of names for the different systems. This was very handy. And you um, can see in January 1st, 1983 was the flag day where we switched to TCP. And here's the illustration of kind of two TCP flows with throughput on um, the uh, Y axis and time on the X axis uh, coordinating their transmission rate. So initially they're over transmitting, then they're, they back off and then they slowly figure out what is the right amount of data to send such that um, they don't overwhelm the network. We'll talk about how this works in detail um, later on in the course. Okay. At the same time, um, in France, there was the Minitel project, which converted the telephone network that was used in France into a packet switch network based on the X25 protocol, which was different from, from uh, TCP IP. And the French government um, connected or built these mini-net terminals and offered it for free to any French home that, that wanted it. And so these became very popular. You, could, you had free services such as phone directories through Minitel, but you also had many commercial websites or commercial pages, I guess, at this point. Um, and you would pay for the usage of those pages uh, kind of through your phone bill. So by the time that Minitel was quite well um, sort of spread out throughout France and used in France, most people in the United States haven't even heard of the internet. So this was kind of a very, very cool precursor of much of the early web functionality that happened before the internet just in France. And okay. so in 1991, uh, there were a bunch of changes to the internet, which basically opened it up for commercial use. This was especially true for the NSFnet, and so can date the public internet from about 1991. Okay. I remember there were these routers at home that you would connect to your um, phone network. They had this very distinctive tone. You might have heard. Um, 
And so these things were very, very slow, but you could send email and maybe download an image. Okay. This was, um, of course, kind of coupled with um, the development of the web by Tim Berners-Lee at CERN. Um, so the World Wide, World Wide Web basically was based on HTTP or hypertext. Um, and so he was the inventor of that and with his colleagues developed kind of the first browsers for Netscape. So there was an interesting problem in that, how do you download a browser? Well, you kind of can't. So what people did was uh, distribute browsers on these disks, which you would have to load one after another to kind of load the browser into your computer. And I remember traveling with my father to conferences and uh, to computer science conferences and uh, Netscape Navigator was always being handed out. You could almost like count on getting a box of Netscape Navigator. We had like 10 boxes at, at our home. Um, so with the kind of introduction of the web, there were what were called killer apps such as email. Um, obviously email I mentioned was kind of present since 1970s, but this is the first time it reached businesses and people's homes at a large scale instant messaging, as well as eventually peer-to-peer -peer applications for file sharing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can also think of the internet evolution as not just the evolution of the network, but also the evolution of end devices that enable different type of traffic, okay? So um, in the 1980s, we had personal computers that looked much like this. I definitely remember these. These have the old floppy drive, which you had to like put in this flimsy thing and then lock this lever in place to, to kind of start reading it. Um, and the local network connecting these was Ethernet. Okay? This e Ethernet made possible for these computers to function within an office. Right, and at home through a modem, but mostly at offices, every worker could have one, um, pretty much, and um, that drove a lot of the type, a lot of kind of business traffic, a lot of email, a lot of database queries that was all available through these machines and Ethernet. Hey, in the 1990s, we had America Online, which delivered internet to people's homes in the United States, um, and we also had the beginnings of um, mobile networks through GPRS, and this is kind of a, a, you know, a Blackberry from that period, which, which used these early networks. It would still transmit very, very little data, but it was enough to kind of provide different information apps um, on Blackberries or on other phones. Okay. Then, or now-ish, this I guess slide is a couple years old, um, we had streaming services, which introduced a lot of traffic. Uh, for streaming video, uh, YouTube, of course, Netflix, etc., etc., and we had mobile devices. So, um, fiber at home, um, faster networks at home, cable networks, LTE, as far as mobile networks, um, kind of supported these new, very, very uh, bandwidth hungry applications. And in the future, we can expect more autonomous devices. Um, which are supported not only by networks, but also by cloud computing, which um, interestingly enough becomes a network of its own. So a lot of the principles in networking you will learn are actually very applicable to building distributed systems of cloud servers. And as these systems become distributed, well, now you're going to start dealing with the types of networking problems that are present in the networks themselves. Okay, so we can also talk about the kind of applications that were uh, present throughout the evolution of the internet. So in the 1980s, your Apple II looked like this. If you were awesome and I had two disk drives, uh, or two floppy drives rather, okay, that basically allowed you to copy stuff from one floppy to another, which was awesome. Um, and you had email, news groups, and kind of remote access through, through your modem. Um, to these types of services, a lot of um, FTP, a lot of Telnet, kind of pre-browser. Pre 1990s, you had browsers, you had uh, obviously the web, and with the web came uh, e-commerce, which was obviously hugely inf influential. 2000s, um, the first iMac, which looked awesome and kind of terrifying at the same time with those speakers. Um, and of course, peer-to-peer -peer came in, um, Napster, 
um, LimeWire downloading um, MP3s, later videos. You had voice over IP first, video conferences, um, YouTube, Netflix, um, all kinds of kind of media rich content being delivered to devices. Okay. And now, of course, everything has, is moving to mobile, has already moved to mobile. Um, in Europe, for example, very few people, well, that's not true, but a lot of people I know don't even have a modem at home. They will just use their phone for internet. Uh, they will just open, up, open it up as, a, as an access point and just use that. Um, a lot of data being streamed to phones, of course. Um, a lot of data being consumed even by other mobile devices like watches. Um, kind of at home assistance. So end devices are becoming uh, kind of more varied than just an evolution of a standard computer that just looks slicker and slicker. Okay. All right. So um, what technologies are changing the internet today, right? What is kind of coming down the way? Well, fiber to home is very, very interesting, especially in Montana. I am perpetually, for the last 10 years, a block away from fiber, which is killing me. I really want fiber at home, um, but for now, I'm still unable to get it. I'm hoping for unlimited bandwidth, but um, that is just a hope because what happens with bandwidth is as soon as you provide it to users, as long as network supports, as soon as network supports more bandwidth, application developers figure out how to use it. So your bandwidth is unlimited for a very short amount of time and then there's a new application that kind of eats it up, which is a good thing, okay? We also have 5G um, networks. As they are being deployed and developed, they will provide ultra low latency on the order maybe of five milliseconds, which is very fast. It's potentially fast enough to deal with cyber sickness such that you could have something like just very, very thin client glasses um, and all the processing could be done on an edge server. This is sort of some of the research that I'm working on. Now, just because the network provides low latency doesn't mean you're going to have edge capacity to do the processing and still get a response back in five milliseconds. Uh, so there's a lot of really interesting network challenges there. Um, we're going to have more autonomous devices, which, deal, which will produce so much traffic. So this idea of unlimited bandwidth will kind of go away pretty quickly. So the idea behind it is that humans are kind of limited in the amount of bandwidth they can consume um, by the virtue of our limited attention span and by the virtue of the fact that our eyes and ears and other senses can only receive so much data, right? There's kind of a, a, a limit per person. And we can't do it all the time, right? We just get overloaded. So um, what happens with autonomous devices is that one, they can produce and consume much more data than humans can. And also there can be many, many more of them than of us. And so really the future internet will not so much cater to people as consumers, but to devices as, as consumers. Okay. And one cool thing that I'm very, very excited about myself is this idea of brain to brain communications. This is something that people are working on. Uh, if you want to look up Neuralinks, it's one of Elon Musk's companies. And um, the idea there is to directly scan brain activity and then interpret that um, or potentially send it to, to other sources, um, to other destinations. Now, the cool thing is that you can not only read brain activity, but also create it through implants or through um, kind of external devices. I think implants are the most promising technology, but there are some other cool ones, for example, um, you can open uh, neuron connections or you can get basically neurons to send uh, signals across synapses by uh, shooting at them with lasers. Uh, you do need genetically modified neurons, but with CRISPR, maybe that is something that will eventually reach humans. Mm, don't know. This stuff is still far away and neurologists are working on this stuff furiously, but I am very, very excited for the possibility of this becoming real enough that we need to design networks to cater to this type of traffic. Um, I think that will be kind of a, be as big a step in human communication as the printing press was and as the internet has been. I think this is the next frontier and it's a matter of time before we get there. So, but for now you can kind of just see what crazy things people are doing. It's definitely not ready for production and there's lots and lots of ethical issues to work out with this um, idea as well. All right, so 
we can also think of the network evolution in terms of the type of applications that have been built. And it turns out that all of these type of deployment systems are still in place. So this is more of a, not like a time evolution necessarily, but a, a spectrum of possibilities. So um, the first types of systems that were built were client, serv client and server systems. This will be kind of the first system you guys build um, as part of your programming assignment. Um, and so you have a central server and you have a bunch of clients connecting to it. Now, this is nice because if you control the server, you basically control the application. So it gives you a, a, a good amount of control over what people see. It's easy to evolve the application. But this doesn't scale, right? You would need a um, bunch of servers. Well, that creates a whole different model. So if you just have one server, that server can only be so big, right? That server, if it's only one, is also not going to be close to a lot of users. It's going to be close to some users, but if you're trying to run a global application, um, there will be users that are far away from that server. And also availability is difficult to provide because if that server goes down, your, server be your service becomes unavailable. And so that's a problem. So what people did is they moved to hybrid systems, eventually to the cloud, um, but onto basically systems where there are many, many servers providing the same, the same service. Um, so cloud is just an iteration of that, but kind of Napster was a good example of, of early system where you had um, kind of distributed servers that provided the directory information for where data could be found on user hosts. You had um, Skype, which started as a peer-to-peer -peer system, but after it was bought by Microsoft, it transitioned to being server hosted. Okay, so you have a, a large network of servers providing the same service. This provides you more scalability, um, it provides you more availability because if one server fails, users can switch to another server. But because the service is still running on servers, you do have control over what these servers provide. And you do have a decent amount of scalability because you can always add more servers. Now, the downside is that because you are running all the servers yourself, you are paying for those servers. So to run this type of system, you need to not only figure out how to do it from the technical perspective, but you also need to have a business model that pays for your cloud computing costs or your server costs. Okay. And so then we can move further down on the scalability scale, which also increases system complexity, to peer-to-peer -peer systems. And this is an illustration of a distributed hash table, which is um, basically a method for organizing nodes in the internet into some logical structure that allows them to kind of traverse each other to find the data that they want. I'll talk about these a little bit later as well. Um, but you do need to have some sort of protocol to organize these nodes in some way, maybe this ring. These nodes could be geographically anywhere. This is just a logical ring. So you do need a lot of coordination to make these peer-to-peer -peer systems work. Now, what they give you is this wonderful thing of property of scalability because every node in here is both a client of the system and a server of the system and then it contributes resources that other nodes can use. So the more people you have using the system, the more capacity the system has. Okay, so you have this sort of sales self-scalability. Okay? Um, cost is low because you're relying on other people's resources. Availability is high because these types of networks can tolerate failures. But it is difficult to control this network, right? If you want to um, change the application, change the code that is running on these nodes, you need to get everybody to agree to move the code into a new version, right? You can't really do a flag day like we did in the early days of internet. These systems can have hundreds of thousands of nodes. And so um, what you need to do is kind of slowly evolve the implementation of the system through agreement. This is a problem that blockchains face in terms of governance, and there's a lot of work on how to get governance right, right to allow the systems to evolve. Turns out these types of systems are also not very ISP friendly. ISP stands for Internet Service Provider, or basically the network you're connecting to. Um, because they, the traffic patterns in those systems is such that nodes aren't necessarily communicating with other nearby nodes. And so 
packets could be kind of pinged around the internet, which is very costly to um, ISPs. Okay. Um, and then security is also difficult to achieve because you have such a large footprint, these networks can be attacked, taken over, botnets become an issue, um, but you have a lot of challenges and you have, but you also have a lot of advantages in terms of scaling, cost and availability. So going back to this axis, you can see that ideally we would want to run everything like this, but if we want systems to scale, which we have to, right? That's kind of what happens to successful systems. We need to move them to the right. And so as we move them to the right, we gain scalability, but we also gain complexity. Okay. And then we have more and more kind of problems that we need to deal with through protocols, through clever implementations, through standardization. Okay. So that we can build something that's scalable like this, but to the user, it still behaves like something like that. Okay. That's, that's the idea. We want to provide the illusion of a centralized service on an infrastructure that's scalable. Okay, so just a quick question for you guys to consider is what architecture you would use to build an online social network and a Google Maps based application. Okay. You can pause the video and think about it here. Okay, so for an online social network, the first thing to consider is what type of traffic exists in that network. Turns out that a lot of users in social networks, this is part of my PhD work, communicate with other nearby users, right? Mostly you're communicating with people in Bozeman or mostly people in England are communicating with other people in England. So there is this locality of interest. Okay? And so those types of services are served well by distributed network of servers. You can have cloud servers in every country or even kind of in different regions, maybe per state. For example, California, I'm sure, could benefit from its own servers. There's enough traffic there. And so um, a hybrid architecture works very, very well there. Now, for something like Google Maps, um, you also need to think about functionality. Well, there is a need to run queries, okay? For example, how to find a route from A to B, but then a lot of the data that is actually being delivered to the applications is static. Those are map tiles, those are different images. And so you can have a fairly centralized architecture for um, serving those queries. I mean, maybe, of course, it would still be hybrid. You would still have more than one server, but it could be kind of closer to this client server model. But all the data that is being delivered to the application, uh, like the map tiles, that could be delivered through a peer-to-peer -peer system or a content distribution network, which we'll talk about in a few days, uh, which is basically a very large network, network of servers in the internet, which are just caches. They just serve data um, that has been requested by user. And so likely another user will request the same data in the same area. And so they're basically a distributed network of caches, which work internally very much like a peer-to-peer -peer system. Okay, so another thing I want to kind of delve into is um, how do processes communicate? How do applications communicate on end-to-end -end basis and what happens to their data? How is it handled? So let's say we have a Facebook application that is running on your phone. It's communicating through your um, cellular network to the internet through a series of routers, goes to a data center that um, serves that application. Okay, so we have an application implementation here on the phone, um, and we have an application implementation on the data center. Now these are different implementations. This is the server, this is the client, but they still talk to each other. Okay, so there are some messages being sent from one application to another. Now those messages don't get sent directly between the applications, they first go to the transport layer, okay? And the, tr the interface from the application or transport layer is via a socket. And the idea of a socket comes from, you guessed it, the socket in the phone switchboard. Okay? It's the same concept. So the application data goes to a transport layer socket. Okay? And um, the application is implementing part of the socket functionality or is calling part of the socket functionality. Okay? Now, bulk of the transport layer 
is implemented in the OS. Okay, so when you start a computer, like a you know, brand new computer, it would have the transport layer already there for you, for your applications. Okay? From the transport layer, data goes to the network layer to create IP packets, which are then forwarded to the data link layer, and that is all implemented inside the operating system. Now, by the time you hit the data link layer, the operating system invokes the network card and passes the, the packets, or at this point, data frames from the link layer to the network card, which uses its physical connection to actually send the electromagnetic signals. Okay, and then when data is received by the server, it is received on a network card, which then passes it to the OS, which then looks at the data link frames, eventually reconstructs an IP packet. Enough of those arrive, you have a, um, you can reconstruct a TCP message or some portion of a stream and then pass it on to the application via the socket where it can be interpreted. Okay, so that's kind of the, the process. Um, I should also add, that I don't know if anyone has noticed yet, I, I guess I can check the discussions now that those are live, um, that this is layer seven while transport is layer four. Okay, so we have physical one, data link two, network layer three. Sometimes we'll talk about the network layer or, um, or uh, um, network layer three, right? We'll talk about the layer three. Uh, the transport layer, which is four, then you have um, a session layer, which is five, and a presentation layer, which is six, and then application layer, which is seven. So those session and presentation layers was something that was present in the early uh, definition of the stack, but over time, those have been incorporated in the application layer. Okay? So now application layer kind of subsumed those presentation and session layers. The session layer basically provided you connectivity even if with a server, even if the TCP socket was broken, you could kind of create a new TCP socket but have the same session. The presentation layer provided data to the application layer in some format. Um, turns out as more formats were created that the, trans the presentation layer kind of became useless and, and the application layers just kind of handled that on their own. So those layers are not used, but we still talk about layer four, layer three, layer two, layer one, and application layer, which is layer seven. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is the types of services um, that applications need the network to provide. Okay. So um, here we have examples of different applications and we have an examples, um, names of different services that the network can provide. So for example, your network or a network can guarantee that there is no loss um, or, or let me say it differently, the, um, the delivery of the traffic makes sense only if there is no loss or it could be that a particular stream can tolerate loss of certain packets. Okay, so um, the network could provide this service or that but this is really the property of the application whether or not it can tolerate loss of some packets um, or not. Okay. You can also look at the throughput as being elastic or inelastic. Okay. So for some applications, some applications can run regardless of what is the amount of throughput that the application is getting. It will run better if there's more throughput, um, but it will still function if there's kind of a lower network throughput. On the other hand, some applications or some traffic flows, the traffic flows of some applications cannot run if there isn't enough bandwidth. Okay? And then you can have applications that are time sensitive or not time sensitive. So time sensitive meaning that data has to be delivered within some deadline for it to be usable and time insensitive means that um, whenever, the whenever the data arrives, it's still usable. Maybe if you have to wait a long time, it's not great, but the system can still work. All right, so we can look at file transfer as an example where that application will not tolerate any loss, right? If you're transmitting a file, all the bytes of that file have to be delivered for you to be happy with the fact that you got the file, right? If you got the file with some missing bytes, you didn't really get the file. So file transfer cannot tolerate loss. Um, but the throughput is elastic. Okay, so if you have more throughput, you'll deliver the file sooner. If you have less throughput, you will have to wait longer for the transmission, but you still get the file at the end. Okay. 
And then you can ask whether or not it's time sensitive. Obviously, that depends on the file, but in general, um, we don't consider that as, as a time sensitive um, application, right? Those packets can kind of arrive at different times and eventually when they reconstruct the file, you're still pretty happy um, that you got the file, okay? So consider the other major applications that are present in the internet, such as email, web browsing, real-time audio, stored video or streaming video, uh, interactive games, and text messaging. And try to fill in these, the rest of this table in terms of where do you think they would fall in the data loss throughput and time sensitive categories. So this is a good time to pause the video and think about how would you fill those in. All right, so here's how I would fill those in. Um, so for email, um, you don't tolerate any loss. You want all of the email to get there. Uh, throughput is elastic, just like for file, and it's not really time sensitive. You know, I mean, I don't check my email often for a few hours, so, huh, you know, it's probably not that time sensitive. Okay, web browsing also doesn't tolerate loss. You do want everything that's on the web page. It is elastic, but it used to be considered not time sensitive, but now it is increasingly being considered time sensitive. There is a lot of research work, some of it my own, that um, worked on the improvement of uh, web performance. There's lots of web performance metrics. There's lots of kind of metrics saying that if websites are slow, uh, people, services lose money. I think it was something that like every 10 milliseconds costs of delay on Amazon costs Amazon some millions of dollars. Um, you can find it pretty easily. It's kind of a staggering number um, how network delay translates to people kind of abandoning what they were going to buy. Okay. Real-time audio. So sounds, audio streams, right? Maybe like a telephone conversation type of thing. Um, is in fact loss tolerant, right? So if you don't receive some of the voice packets, humans can still reconstruct the sound. They will be less happy, but it still works, okay? But the throughput is quite inelastic. Turns out that voice is encoded at, you know, whatever, 56 bits per second, 92 bits per second, that's it. It's constant. And so if you can deliver that amount of uh, throughput, your application works. If you can't deliver it, you're gonna have gaps in audio and um, no one's going to be happy about it, okay? It is also time sensitive. So um, there's lots of studies on how quickly voice should be delivered. It's about 200 milliseconds is the kind of absolute deadline after which people will start kind of colliding by starting to speak at the same time because they don't realize that someone else has, has or hasn't finished speaking, okay? Store video is also loss tolerant. We can kind of um, miss some frames and still be happy with, relatively happy with the replay quality. It is elastic in the sense that video can be encoded at different resolutions. And of course, you know, when you have poor network connection, your Netflix will drop resolution. Um, and it isn't particularly time sensitive in that you can buffer the video ahead of playback. Um, and, you know, you can kind of Sacrifice the you know 10 seconds or 30 seconds of initial buffering as long as the playback remains smooth smooth after that. Okay, interactive games so something like like a real time shooter game um, is loss tolerant. You don't need to receive every position update. Obviously, the more of them you have, the more the less teleporting you're going to see in the game. Um, but the throughput is relatively inelastic. There is some amount of updates that have to be delivered. Um, and that is, those are kind of collected at a, at uh, fixed intervals, right? It's like there's a position update every so many milliseconds and it is time sensitive, right? Delivering a position update five seconds later doesn't really help you because you can't incorporate it into the, into the replay or into the visualization. Okay. And then text messaging would tolerate no loss, but it is elastic in terms of throughput and, um, it is not particularly time sensitive. All right. So when you think about different applications, anything that's not on this list, chances are, in fact, that you can kind of bring it down to one of these categories. Or you can say that, you know, there is some portion of the traffic that behaves a lot like an interactive game and some other traffic that behaves a lot like real-time audio. Um, actually, those are terrible examples because they have the same requirements, but um, I don't know, maybe you have some... Uh, 
you know, streaming video and you have some interactive update traffic, right? So you can kind of break down the traffic of any application into these categories or maybe create new categories if none of these fits for some reason, right? And then you can look at the network and say, to what degree does my network provide me with uh, the type of performance that I would consider adequate, okay? Every network is gonna have some amount of loss, okay? So can my traffic tolerate the type of loss that, I'm ex that I can have on a network or do I need to have some reliability mechanisms that will increase my delay, okay? Um, does my network provide enough throughput? If it doesn't, do I need to encode data differently? Do I need to send less data? right? Um, and is my traffic time sensitive, right? So um, often you don't really have a choice about the type of network performance that you get or that your users get, so you kind of need to adjust. But the interesting thing that comes in with 5G is that um, there actually are different services or different kind of profiles of network performance that your application could access in a 5G application. So you may be able to make choices for different uh, parts of your application flow to use different functionalities of the network. Um, and as long as you match those correctly, you will get satisfactory performance at your application layer with kind of minimized cost um, for um, your packet transmissions. All right, and that's it for today. A um, couple announcements. I guess I have the forums finally posted, um, so you can start discussions, you can start looking for partners. That was a, um, kind of some queries to detail on how to do this correctly. Um, I have also posted the first programming assignment. I'm going to talk about it on Friday, so there's no reason to get started on that yet unless you feel ambitious, but I will still give you guys more tools on how to build um, this client server application. Uh, so right now it may seem confusing the way some of the stuff is worded, but I promise it will make more sense. Um, and if you have any questions, we can of course talk about them in office hours. So thank you guys.